Our next session is the first of our open plenary sessions, and I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator for that session, which is Catherine Lekesner. Um, it's the operator's view. Catherine herself has vast experience as an international advisor to the hotel sector. She's recently entered the world of academe as a visiting professor at the Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne. Uh, so please welcome Catherine to the stage to introduce her panel and to host the operator's view. Thank you. Just tweet that up. Thanks, everybody, and welcome to the State of the Nation. It's quite a grand title. Um, thankfully, there aren't any presidential types here. We're really going to talk this morning to the professionals. These are the people who are creating the experiences, delivering the hospitality and ultimately delivering value into the real estate assets we call hotels. Um, and in the unpredictability that is our business, unfortunately one of our pa panellists was dragged out of his bed in the early hours of the morning. Karen Kana, who is VP of Operations for Intercontinental, has had to go and deal with one of the hotels and the utilities issue. So sadly he can't join us, um, but please do spare thought for the him. However, delighted to welcome our three panellists to the stage. Um, they represent independents, owners, owner-operators, third-party operators, franchisees. So we'll have a good range of debate through that and representation of all the different types that we find in our industry. Um, let's get them up on stage and then I'll introduce them properly. So, Serena von der Heide, who is the owner of the Georgian House Hotel in London. Um, what you may not know about Serena is that she uh, was planning, when she left school, to go off and study Arabic. And due to a quirk of what I will call fortune, um, inherited a two-star, 23-room hotel in London. Um, had a change of tack, and over the last 30 years has transformed the asset into a 68-bedroom, award-winning five-star boutique hotel, complete with wizard chambers um, inspired by the Harry Potter series. So welcome, Serena. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, I'll go on then to Nicholas on the far side of the stage from me. Nicholas is managing director for the UK and Ireland for interstate hotels and resorts. Nicholas oversees a portfolio of around 71 hotels across the country. Um, had a busy, busy year this year. I think he opened nine hotels, something in the region of 1,500 rooms, Correct. with another 11 due to open in the year ahead. Um, that portfolio carries a range of brands. So Nicholas really is the third-party operator, as we know and love, um, carrying brands such as Accor, IHG, Hilton, Wyndham, Residor. Full range in there. Um, let me introduce you then to David Taylor, who took up the challenge to reinvent and regenerate the principal hotel brand. Um, and as many of you will know that after Starwood Capital acquired it in 2013, they went on to pump in something in the region of a cool £200 million worth of investment into that portfolio. Um, now seven hotels, four of which are up and running and three more to open in 2018. Um, so you've really had your work cut out. So look, there's your introduction. This is your panel. What we want to go through really is talking about the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, threats in our industry. But we're going to kick off with what has been a pretty storming year in terms of performance. Um, I know that Joe and David will talk a little bit more about performance going forward, but just to give you an idea, let's do some top-line numbers here. London and the regions, Revpar, for the 12 months to August of this year, we're up 5%. Largely ADR-driven. This is in the, on the background of almost 6% of hotel supply in London and over 2% in the regions. It's been a pretty extraordinary year for many reasons, and we'll go on to have a chat about that. But 
Nicholas, why don't you start and give us a, an overview of how your year's been? Sure. Uh, it's been a great year. Um, uh, five and a half percent is the rev par growth that we have seen so far this year across our hotels. The majority of our hotels are in, in the regions, in the provinces, so we haven't had the, the bubble of, of London in those numbers, and I know Serena will talk about that in a moment, but we've seen good growth, uh, marginal growth in occupancy, uh, and our occupancies now are running at close to 80%, uh, which in the, in the provinces in the UK uh, we, we are very pleased about. Clearly there have been some, some bubbles uh, in the provinces. Edinburgh, as a good example, is, is very, very strong uh, at the moment, uh, as well as Hull, uh, city of culture for, for this year. Uh, we've, we've seen some huge growths there, obviously driven to a degree by the, the value of the pound. Uh, I think that's well documented that that's had a, a real impact on, on visitors uh, coming to the UK. I was reading the, uh, the Visit Britain report uh, last week, and they were saying it's been a record year for people coming in to the UK. I think it's an 8% growth year on year uh, of, of visitors coming to the UK. Interestingly, though, business visitors are down by 3% in the, in the same period. So I think that's, a, that's sort of an interesting dynamic. We are definitely seeing more leisure and less business corporate but the, the, the overall blend is, uh, is, is, is very positive. So I think um, it's, it's very much, um, oh sorry, the other area as well we've seen some good growth is the airports. Uh, again, on the back of historical terrorism issues, uh, Tunisia, for example, Egypt, where an awful lot of the airports were just, they were not flying from there at all, we've seen some very good growths in the airports as well. So generally, it's been a very good year. David, you're now one year in in a number of your assets. How's 2017 panning out for you? Yeah, uh, so, Catherine, as you, as you say, we, we launched a principal brand um, last November uh, here in Manchester um, with the rejuvenation of what was the Palace Hotel. And so, first of all, I guess we've, we've got the context of a, a, a new, somewhat fledgling brand at the moment of three properties. Um, so, so Upon Starwood Capital buying uh, three hotel companies plus some individual assets and us taking time to sort of evaluate how those brands were going to sit together, we decided that we would, we would create Principal and, and latterly um, Devere. Um, so 2017 is really our, our first year of core operation post-renovation in, in, in Edinburgh, York and, and Manchester. Um, and and uh, agreeing with the comments made earlier by Nick that um, you know, with, with, with Edinburgh, Edinburgh continues to be a very, very solid performance. Um, across the three assets, given that you know, all three hotels have seen repositioning of those assets completely and, and also benefiting from, in, in most cases, great market, uh, market demand, uh, we're seeing red power growth over a two-year period of over 30%, so mm -hmm. very positive. It's a good start. Indeed. More to come. More to come, I hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Serena? I'm going to ask you a slightly uh, provocative question, but it, London uh, occupancy was, is, is running over 80%, has been for many years now. Um, ADR going up and up. Is, is London getting complacent? How has your year been and what's been driving it? Uh, we have had a great year. Um, again, our rev par has been up by nearly 20%. Um, a lot of that due to ADR, but also we're uh, largely a leisure hotel. And so, for instance, we saw our occupancy in January rise from 49% to 80% this year. So um, it, it's been a mix of contributing factors that have helped us reach that um, uh, increased rev par. Uh, are we becoming complacent? No, we're not, and we can't afford to be, because um, London has at the same time been swamped with extra supply um, across all different hotel levels, we've seen a lot of new rooms come on stream, and also um, we can't underestimate the um, impact of the Airbnb room supply, which is absolutely, um, uh, it's, it's been a huge factor for us. And if you were to, uh, it, from, from an Airbnb perspective, we've, we've, it's been around for a while now, we've talked a lot about it across the various conferences. Um, specific examples of how it affects your business, Serena? It's very difficult to measure the business that you're not getting. Um, but for instance, we had um, a, a regular booking before the Chelsea Flower Show, exhibitor, all their um, 
uh, th their team that came down three weeks beforehand to put the stand together and then to, to work the stand. And he, two years ago, wrote to me and said, I'm really sorry, we've been with you for seven years now. We've loved staying with you, but I can pay half the price and put my team up in a flat just around the corner from the showground. And that's frustrating for me because I know that that flat owner is not paying the same kind of things that I am. It's not a level playing field. They're not paying the same kind of business rates, the health and safety measures, all those, those costs that as hoteliers we have to meet. Um, so difficult to measure, but uh, it's undoubtedly there. The, me the measurement issues, I think, is, is a real challenge from, from that perspective. Um, you think it's going to have an impact, and it's, it, there are very few specific examples other than something like that that Serena has just articulated. We, we had one uh, relatively recently, which was a, um, a public sector conference uh, that was coming to Birmingham. And we'd put a bid in along with, because we, we, uh, we operate a number of hotels in, in Birmingham, and the public sector conference actually came back and said, no, we're not going to be going to hotels we are going to go with Airbnb. Because uh, Airbnb, I think it's, it's fairly well known, have launched their, their business arm. Um, and they're now saying, I think, that 10% of their bookings are business related um, across all of their, their units. They've introduced, uh, I think it's called business travel ready homes. So they have to have 24 hour, all the types of things that we might say as hoteliers, oh, well, Airbnb can't possibly do that because they haven't got 24 hour reception, they haven't got this, they haven't got that. They're now creating this, uh, this product that is business travel ready. Um, and also, they're marketing it to groups. So they're saying, well, if you're going to a conference, particularly this was a, a city wide conference example, if you're going to a conference, why don't you get your teams to stay in groups within these homes? And they have to be homes. They can't be single rooms in, in houses. So I think Airbnb is going to become, it's already a challenge. I think it's going to become more and more of a challenge, particularly within the business environment and not just the leisure environment. They're very focused on it. I mean, it's, I think 10% of their bookings, but in terms of room nights, it's a, a much higher number mm -hmm. than that. And it's a, it's a big focus for them. And in terms of the operational challenges that you are facing in your, or in your businesses, over, certainly over this last year where we've had currency devaluation, which on the one hand has been a boon, because of course it's driven a lot of your leisure, overseas leisure travel. And yeah. to your point, Nicholas, I think the um, Visit Britain report was also saying spending is up 9% this year, which is a staggering number when you look at it in terms of tourism trips. Um, so we've had that bonus of devaluation on the one hand, but when we start to look at operational costs and operations generally, how has that played out in your businesses? Because since you have a, a sort of fairly large portfolio, have you seen an impact on that front? I mean, sure. I mean, yes, you're right. The Brexit, the, the double-edged sword, the currency that we've uh, devaluation, and we've seen the result of the increased revenues uh, from that. Um, Labour and also product supply, I guess, are the two key issues from a Brexit perspective. Uh, Labour, and I'm sure we're, we're, we're all suffering from, from the same challenge, whereby people, particularly from Eastern Europe, who we rely on very heavily in, in our hotels, uh, and not just, I mean, the traditional model is within housekeeping, but actually across all the areas in the hotel. Uh, we are now starting to hear stories coming from either are outsourced housekeeping providers, and we use those in a number of hotels. We, we run both models, both outsourced and, and run internally. And for the first time, we're starting to now hear from particularly the outsourced suppliers, there's a real challenge encouraging people to come and work within their agencies. Uh, we, we opened a, a large hotel recently at, at one of London's airports, and the agency have had to now rent houses to encourage people to come over. Um, and that, that's sort of like going back 30 and 40 years ago with the, the, the staff housing that we used to have in hotels. But to hear that agencies are doing that is really very challenging. And then on the, the, other, the other big one, clearly, in terms of, uh, of goods and particularly food and importing food, we didn't really see for the, for the second six months after Brexit a huge impact on, on food costs. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that the majority of the suppliers had actually fixed their currency rates with, uh, with their producers and their growers. 
but since the beginning of January, we've seen a steady increase in food inflation. So those are the particularly Brexit orientated are the two big factors that have had a, an impact on, and are continuing to have an impact and that we are having to put in plans to counter over the coming years. I can absolutely agree with that on the recruitment piece. Um, it's, recruitment's changed to a sales role now. Um, before an applicant would come to an interview to try and win a job, now we hold interviews to try and win an applicant. Um, it, it's completely changed and um, we're falling over ourselves to try and hire. We're seeing um, wage inflation and I think that's going to carry on for quite a while. Uh, I think to pick up on the, pick on the points made, clearly, um, and, it, and it's been an industry-wide issue for the last 40 years, it's not a new thing, let's be honest, so we can, we can, we can use Brexit as a, as a consequence of it, but um, you know, the, the, the biggest headwind we have in our business today is labour, and, and ultimately um, there have been things that we've all done, Nicholas referred to obviously using you know, both um, highly talented in many cases, you know, Eastern European labour, but equally the use of agencies. Um, and I think ultimately uh, our job has to be around how do we bring people into this fabulous industry, um, but more importantly, how do we retain people by growing our own? Um, and, and without getting into a, you know, a, a great debate about um, you know, how supportive, or perhaps I should say unsupportive, the UK government is towards our fabulous industry, um, irrespective of people like the BHA continuing to bang our drum, that there are too many, um, too many things that are, are hindering our ability to get people into our business, and, and it does ultimately come back to the schoolroom, um, you know, in, in terms of us trying to get people at that level where we can influence children and their parents to come into our business, because we know that once you're in the business, irrespective of, of you know, social economic background, qualifications, it's a business where if you work hard, you can, you can work your way to the top, and I strongly believe that. In, in, in terms of obviously the, um, the, the overall environment, um, as well as housekeeping, I think it, it has been a, a big challenge for a very, very long time, but I think chefs is, is at crisis point. Um, yeah. To the degree that uh, you know, we joke in some of our, our, sort of our, our restaurants, it might be easier to give someone a fiver in terms of go down the road rather than eat in the restaurant, um, because the only people getting rich um, you know, seem to be uh, our friends from housekeeping agencies and chef recruiters at the moment. Yeah. And David, you obviously, let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more directly around the impact of Brexit. You were in the planning stage pre-Brexit and obviously have launched hotels post-Brexit. Let's talk a little bit around the labour issue and how you approach that. Yeah, I, think, I think, Catherine, for, for us, um, when, when Starwood Capital bought what was Principal Haley, um, Four Pillars, De Vere Venues and, and a number of hotels around the UK, um, and I, I was asked to come and sort of, in essence, create what is today Principal, um, before we even sort of started sketching out what we thought the brand should be, um, my first appointment and really the first six to nine months that, that we spent in terms of looking at what, what we wanted this group of city centre assets to be was about what, what is our people message. Um, the hotels that, um, that I was gifted were already commercially very successful. Um, they, they've always sort of stood in, in good grounding, whether you look at, you know, STR or profitability, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, it was really about, um, again, this, this, this people issue is not new. Um, and and in certainly in the markets that we operate, um, listening to Greg talking about York, you know, I, I think, you know, we've come to the conclusion that there's probably very little, if no, unemployment in York. And certainly the people probably who are unemployed are unemployable. So that, that, that's just you know, either something you... You, you acknowledge and sort of hope there's a solution coming down the track or you say we've got to bring people into our business and grow our own. So first of all, our, our first appointment was, a, was, was my sort of right-hand right -hand man who's a people development director who was, um, who, who was very much around in the beginnings of Malmaison on the Hotel de Van. And, you know, we look at it very, very simplistically. We, you know, we've got to get talent into our business. Once we've got them into our business, how do we ultimately retain them? And so that, that has been probably our, our biggest, call it, outgoing in terms of the beginnings of that and as we we started to get into what are the values that we want our employees to live by particularly bearing in mind that to some degree we have we've spent an awful lot of money um, renovating restoring these hotels and uh, to use an analogy you know it's a bit like rewiring the house without turning the electricity off you know so um, you know we've, we've kept these hotels open we've renovated them but ultimately we had to we had to start very very clearly about what what is our people proposition going to be mission vision values and, and so we, we began that journey. And, and in fact, actually, when we rolled out our employee values, which we 
regularly monitor to ensure that they are living and breathing in our hotels. Um, we started that process with a group of um, people which we, we refer to as, ch as change gurus. So in fact, actually, we started talking through of the value proposition and why it was important to, to fellow colleagues, to our guests, and ultimately to our owners. And we rolled that out to the change gurus before we actually delivered that training to the general managers. So rather than have that historical top down, the general manager says, this is a really good idea, it's come from head office. We actually got groups of people that we felt demonstrated our values in our hotels and actually got them to sort of work through and actually start to communicate that almost around the, the business, almost as a splinter group, rather than the general manager saying, this is a dictate. Creating places people want to work. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there, there are rankings and, and votes as to create places of what are the best places to work in the UK. And I have to say that hotels don't typically come high up on that list for lots of reasons. But Serena, you've talked a lot in the past and been very involved in the apprenticeship um, schemes. How have you used that within your business? I think apprenticeships had the opportunity to be very useful to us. And um, I, it's the, the, the change in the apprenticeship scheme this year um, to the new apprenticeship standard does give independent businesses like mine the opportunity to really use the apprenticeships to improve the skill level of their workforce because we are able to, it's a more rigorous um, standard and we're also more able to um, um, plug the gaps, the skill gaps that we have in our business. So for instance, I've got somebody who's come through housekeeping and wants to go into HR and I should be able to get funding for her CIPD qualification through the apprenticeship scheme. And I'm not a levy payer, it means that I have to pay 10% of her qualification, but otherwise we wouldn't have been able to afford that kind of investment in her skills. So it's great for her and it's great for our business. So there are opportunities there, I think, to be able to offer far greater development and skills development for small businesses. Um, I think we're going to have to change how we, how we staff our businesses because the government, this year we had um, net immigration of 340,000. Um, sorry, last year, it's down to 220 this year. The government want to bring it down to 50,000 net immigration. So it, we're already feeling the pinch. We can really feel it on our businesses. We're going to have to find people, not just school leavers, but every part of society we're going to have to attract to our industry. And uh, typically, um, people don't like to work shift patterns. They don't want to work a lot of these less desirable um, roles and, and shift patterns within our businesses. So I think the key for us to do that is to be very flexible in the way we employ. And for instance, I've got um, two ladies, they're sisters, they both have family, and um, they work a role between them. And so they take it in, they, they take it in turns to look after the, the children, and they take it in turns to work this role. And we just have to be flexible with that, and we have, to work, we have to be open to working in different ways. We can no longer say, this is the deal, and, and you've got to do it. If they're twins, that would be great. <laughs> and then nobody would ever know. They actually are. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding. Twins are the way forward. What's the chances of that? We, I mean, we've also heard, then, on, on the subject of labour, that the, uh, the introduction of... Um, AI, some sort of technology that's starting to, to replace some of these roles. If we've got such a crunch on labour, are you looking as businesses into any of the tasks and undertakings your staff do and ways you can work more intelligently or, or technology you can use? Nicholas, is there something you've... Yeah, I mean, technology for, for us, I guess it's, it's twofold. The first is within the whole recruitment and giving people a career and really identifying how technology can help us to do that. So all recruiting is done online now, everybody knows that, but we are now, everything is now online behind the scenes as well for us. So all of our recruitment processes and procedures is, is all done online, so that the days of, of paper have completely disappeared. Um, and also we're launching at the end of this year uh, an app, uh, naturally, uh, where people can actually manage their careers on this app. So this is where I am, this is where I want to do, where I want to be, and the whole, the whole process is managed through that digital age. So we as the, as the manager can see, right, these are the individuals who want to do this, these are the individuals who want to do that, and they can see it on their own app. This is where my career, this is what my opportunities are, this is where I could possibly go. So I think from, from, from that perspective, that, that's really, really helpful, and we're starting to see 
the benefits of that, not least through, through recruitment costs, if, uh, if nothing else. Um, and then, yes, you're absolutely right. And I think, I mean, we work with a number of the, the big brands. Um, so a, a lot of what we do is to a, degree, to a degree reactive as to what the brands are doing. Uh, Hilton have launched Digital Key, for example. So you no longer need to get your key. It's all on your phone. You just go up and, uh, and, and into your room that you go. Obviously, we have uh, the mobile check-in through Accor. So the front desk, per se, is starting to disappear. And you, 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 need, you actually need less employees because you're not having to man this desk. And people can be doing multiple roles, particularly within the, the limited service hotels. So I think that is really where in artificial intelligence is really starting to help uh, with regards to productivity around those areas. Some of the key manual labor, housekeeping, restaurants, that is, that is undoubtedly more challenging. I don't think there is a, a silver bullet so far as, as resolving that one. Um, but yeah, that's the, certainly at this moment in time, that's where we're at. Anything you would add, David? I think probably along the same lines as Nicholas, you know, certainly probably in terms of recruitment, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to try and ensure we have that maximum visibility for people to see what the opportunities they have with us. I, I, I think that um, certainly generationally, I think one of, one of our challenges, and I think there are, there are numerous studies which, which say that it's not just around the rate of pay that you employ somebody, it, it's what we sort of describe as almost that stickiness. And that, we, we've sort of got to work on that stickiness in that first 90 days because, you, you know, certainly you can see in a lot of our stats, you know, we're, we're, we're in city centre locations. You, you've, you've got to get hold of those people and, and ensure that they, are, they are, have, have a sort of an emotional connection, not only to the person that's employed them, but, but what you're trying to be. And, it, and it's, as we know from probably children, friends, millennials, etc., it's not just about the fact that I've come to work and performed this task here. It's about what am I getting back within this organisation and am I being heard? So certainly that, in, in many cases, whilst we, I would say, have built in efficiencies to the recruitment process, we've, we've added in manpower and labour to, to ensure that that stickiness is in place so that once we've, we've hooked people in, we know there's a huge recruitment cost, but actually we can keep them with us over that period of time. We've started a, a Lean Six Sigma business efficiency program within our business because as a small business, wages are going up and we really need to be efficient. So we're looking at each of our processes throughout the business and just mapping them all out and thinking, right, where are we wasting? Where are we wasting skills? Where are we wasting money? Where are we wasting inventory? Where are the different points within the business that we can, that we can save? Because we're going to have to be really fit if we're going to survive these um, um, uh, constant cost pressures. So it's very much an asset management approach to it. so essentially what you're saying and a lot of what you're doing is looking very closely at, at the <coughs> asset itself and how it functions. And obviously, Serena, you looked very closely at the hotel some time ago. And tell us a little bit about your wizard chambers because I'm sure everybody's intrigued. Uh, well, I, I guess that that's one of the... Um, advantages of being a very small operator. You can have a crazy idea and go ahead with it. Um, so we're based near Victoria, and um, uh, we, had, we, we sell tours and, and so on. Um, and when we had a visit from our, our tour seller, uh, he said that the Warner Brothers studio tour was people would come from all over the world, not for London, just for the tour. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could augment that experience by giving a kind of... Uh, something they could stay with us and then go and get the tour from Victoria. And so we've got these kind of gothic, uh, magical rooms in our basement rooms. Not much light down there, which is great. Um, and yeah, they're wonderful. They're kind of, um, uh, we, we've, they're not plasticky at all. They're very authentic. We've used lots of odd antiques and bits and pieces. And they've been incredibly popular. And uh, we've actually increased, we've added, so we've doubled the number now. We're now up to seven, and they have a waiting list. And we sell them without OTAs, which is great. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been quite a, it's been a huge success, actually. It's, it's been great for PR. Um, great for website traffic and all that kind of thing, and uh, it's been a lot of fun as well. Do you need a license from Warner Brothers? Well, we're or? not. We're definitely not a Harry Potter room. Would you say? We, yes, we have had oh, lots of okay. discussions with Warner Brothers. Careful, we are... Nicholas. Careful. No, no, no. I was, just, <laughs> I was just sort of taking it to one stage further because you know where one of the things we could possibly do is. I mean, we sort of work one housekeeper per sixteen rooms in a shift. 
actually we could make that one for 32, or maybe even one for 42. I mean, the productivity would be fantastic. And the cobwebs, as a result, <laughs> they're themed rooms. It's, uh, hang on, just a thought. I, I'm intrigued as to how Serena has gone from 23 rooms to 68. It sounds like a TARDIS, this hotel. <laughs> um, well, um, my great-great-grandfather built that, that part of the street many years ago, and we've slowly... There were all some disparate little businesses that we've slowly brought into the hotel. So um, yeah, they, so there are some that you have to go around the corner. We've got a... Uh, an annex, we don't call it the annex, but it is essentially an annex. So that's how we've slowly spread out. But I think it's, you know, it, it reflects so much of what the industry is about, which is these creative opportunities, reinventing assets. David, you know, you've had a hugely creative, but also, uh, you know, tied very tightly into having a large amount of money to spend. You can talk us through some of the product and, I would say, experiential elements that you've brought into your hotels that reflect some of the consumer changes we're seeing in the market? Sure, of course. Well, we're, 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 very, we're very fortunate that um, the, 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 the president and co-founder of uh, Starwood Capital, Barry Sternlicht, obviously has a, has a sort of background in, in creating Starwood hotels with, with brands like W. So, um, so to some degree, we're, whilst we're, we're owned by ultimately a real estate firm, um, that real estate firm has, has a great belief in trying to build sort of uh, hotel assets and brands which are going to have, again, the stickiness. So, um, so, so when, we, when we started looking at really what, what we could do with these hotels, we had a, a group of city centre hotels, great locations, middle of wonderful cities, whether that might be you know, next to a railway station in New York or in Glasgow or, or sitting on George Street. The, the, the question was really what, what is going to give us a you know, point of difference? Um, we, we've, we've got smart people in, in sales, marketing, distribution, all the things that both ourselves and the brands do. But the question mark was really what, what are the things that we, we felt that were going to um, drive people into our hotels? Um, from my previous background, having sort of uh, launched hotels such as the Hoxton, we, we, we've always tried to sort of take a different view on what that market is doing at a particular moment in time. So to some degree, um, we, 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 we did something which um, I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of sort of hoteliers and operators don't do, is we actually talked to a group of customers and, and said, what, what is it about the UK hotel space that if it is interesting, who's doing it well, what's, what's good, what's bland, um, and, and you know, what would be interesting to see? And, and Talking to, 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 to different markets, um, you know, in terms of not only our corporate customers, but the meetings market, but also talking to individuals who, you know, maybe they're, they're sort of travelling with no kids, travelling with kids, pe people, you know, who've, um, who've perhaps retired and have got a lot of disposable income. And actually, by looking at that, we, we really started to form an opinion of, OK, well, let's, we, we know what we have, so let's try and validate some of the things that we believe makes what we're hoping this brand will be, but also what are the things which, um, to, to some degree, you know, piss people off about staying in hotels. Um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of these things are about, you know, I've, I've paid a rate, why are you now charging me for a number of things that actually I, I think should be included? So taking the, 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 the premise of, of the five values which we looked at for our employees, we started to look at how those sort of translated into a set of set of promises. So one of our one of our sort of values sits around generosity. So it was it was obvious to us that it should be, therefore be a generosity promise. Um, and I think all of us have probably had that moment of trying to squeeze you know the, the shampoo out of a very small bottle and, and actually thinking, well, you know, is someone going to take this home? Probably not if it's made in China. So so we we, we looked at all of all of those things. Some, some are sort of hard things. Some are soft things. Um, you know, certainly uh, I, th I think one of the the, the balances for us and. Um, Unlike uh, Serena and Nicholas, um, we, we do have a hotel in London, but it's, uh, it's closed at the moment, which uh, means that we felt no benefit of, um, of Brexit and probably some of the disadvantages in terms of the number of builders uh, who, who aren't in there at the moment. Um, but ultimately, we're, we're sort of very happy being at the upper end of the four-star market because when, when you get out of those key cities, it, it is hard to operate at a five-star standard. So certainly, we didn't want to be in the, in the business of minibars. So our question was, what can we do so that ultimately you don't see guests, for example, walking... Uh, back in from Sainsbury's, hiding their bag with their beers and their wine and their chocolate they bought in. So as well as, um, so for example, having, having um, tuck boxes um, in, in the bedroom, which have, you know, it's sort of, uh, probably call it tea and coffee making on steroids, um, we, we actually built uh, what was the equivalent of almost Arkwright's corner shop um, in, in the lobby, which, which meant that rather than sort of uh, someone feel as if either A, they've got to run to Sainsbury's or, um, or, or, or B, you know, they're sort of annoyed that they're going to the bar just to grab a beer and again, on the basis we don't have to be in the minibar business, we built this to sort of say, here's a great selection of things and they're at high street prices. And that's just one example of the things that we've been doing. 
Nicholas, you've obviously got a number of intercontinental brands, including the the Holiday Inns with their open lobbies. Have you seen the the change in product or the shift around building communities within lobbies has benefited your portfolio? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, from the perspective of they get a, a lot of use. Um, and certainly that whole communal space <coughs> idea, I think, is becoming more and more relevant. Um, and I think that's also where some of our key competition is coming from as, uh, as well. Uh, so places like WeWork, which I think actually Jonathan's office is in WeWork. There's one in just by Paddington. Uh, and in fact, I stopped off on my way here for my m morning coffee. There's a, a place just up the road called Grindsmith, which again is a mixture of open space where you can get coffee and, and food. And then there are offices and meeting rooms that you can rent by the hour upstairs. So I think that whole concept of open uh, communal living and working is, is really become, coming to the fore. And certainly IHG are one of the brands that have, have adopted that. The challenge is that we're seeing some, some really great growth so far as the, the, bars and restaurants and the uh, bars and restaurants are concerned. That tends to move from the restaurant. So you're moving the spend from one part of the, the traditional restaurant into the bar and the lobby. So one of the challenges for us so far as, as food and beverage is concerned uh, which I think often gets described in Star Trek terms of the f as the final frontier, so far as food and beverage in hotels is concerned, how can we make the, the restaurants equally attractive as those open lobby areas? We've got quite a few questions coming up here. Um, we have five minutes left of our session, and I think the... Uh, the question around non-RIMS revenue, obviously just to uh, address that one, mm. Nicholas. Um, we've talked a lot about retaining talent. So I think just on the non I think meetings, I think yeah. meetings and events is, I think out, sort of traditional outlet food and beverage is, is very challenging because the, the high street is awash with different options. Um, but I think meetings and events is the, is the real focus for us so far as non-room spend. Sorry, I interrupted you. And just on that point, Nicholas, I think I'd probably just build on that, and certainly you, you, you see the third, third space operators coming into the market, and, and as, as hotel operators, hoteliers, I think we've, we've, we've got to get ahead of the curve, because we're still talking about day delegate rates, 24-hour rates, whereas the reality is the, a, lot of, a lot of consumers now just aren't interested in that. So I think our pricing has sort of fallen behind the curve. Um, and, and equally, if you, if you can go into, whether it's a serviced office or a WeWork space and take a space for an hour and then grab a sandwich afterwards, we've got to catch up with that. And it's all, almost how can we look at some of the challenges within our workforce, such as chefs, to say, well, actually, are they interested in having the full buffet and the cheese platter at lunchtime? Or can we look at it differently and have a price point and an option which is more suitable to that, that customer's needs? Sure. Talent retention, I mean, we've touched on it a little bit in, in the... Um, in our discussion already, but one of the things I think you had all mentioned was that you are, are starting to compete with other industries, not just the hotel industry, for your staff. Um, are there any particular strategies that you've been using to attract and retain? Is it, is it you know, we're, we're moving into this experienced generation, is it just that actually they want to work in a more attractive, more atmospheric or authentic product? Or are there things that you can offer and do? I think you've both talked about the career development. And I think that um, as an industry, we can offer a career development and progress that we can demonstrate um, second to none, really. And uh, I think that's one of the greatest hooks for people. If we can give a, a really good um, opportunity to people to improve their skills, to move forward fast, to learn quickly. I think that that's a, a huge incentive to people to come into our industry, and demonstrating that can be key. I think, um, I think really, the, the, there's a sort of premise of, as leaders around collaboration. Um, employees coming into our businesses want, want to feel as if they, they have a seat at the, either the boardroom table or the general manager's table if they're in a hotel. So we, we we need to be and are much more open in what, what, what is going on in the business so people feel that it's easier for Serena, but you know, it, that they do have an active involvement of what's going on. And, and I think we, we, we have to be realistic that you know, in, in some, some roles, we, we could be competing with the next low-cost supermarkets opening down the road. And in some cases, 
in theory, those, that, that sort of opening salary and benefits may look more attractive. However, I do think our, our industry has that opportunity once we've got people hooked and we can show them they can go on that journey, that, that there's a great career for life. So if we look forward very briefly, we're going to wrap up. 2018, we obviously have some labour concerns. There's the uncertainty around Brexit. Let's end on a high note. What do, what do you see your opportunities are going into 2018? Nicholas, why don't we start with sure. you at the end? And then well, we, I see we're, we're very positive about 2018. Um, we believe we can build on the back of a very successful 17, and the indicators are certainly there uh, across the hotels that that will be the case. Um, we're certainly seeing an, an, an enormous amount of interest from developers. Um, it, it was quite slow at the beginning of the year, uh, but we're seeing uh, some real upturn in terms of developers' interest, getting obviously the right site and the right brand is, is absolutely critical. Uh, I think that focus on meetings and events and the non-rooms revenue business uh, is, is really important. Um, but no, we, we are generally across the board very positive about the state of 2018. We've got some, some key strategies that we're needing to put in place to make sure that we counter those, those headwinds. Uh, and sort of Brexit has been described as the long goodbye, and it's this whole uncertainty. And I think we've just got to say, it's there, it's happening, we've got to move on and just and cope with it and, and stop moaning about it and just get on with it and, and, and focus our attentions on how do we make the best of it. And it will be what it will be, so far as the, as the government decisions are concerned. I think there's a great opportunity for independent hotels. Um, there's a real appetite for different nowadays. Lots of the, the brands are inventing smaller, more personal brands. And uh, it's a real opportunity for, for independent operators to, to develop their own character. People want to have a selfie of something different. They don't want what everybody else has got. And uh, so for, for independent op um, in operators, we need to mine our own scene. We need to really stick to our guns and, and exploit our own character and define what makes us different and set us apart and not be frightened to do that. And, and, uh, and for, for principal, uh, 2018, again, probably echoing the comments of, uh, of my colleagues here, um, we, uh, the markets we trade in look very, very positive for the existing principal hotels. We, we have partner hotels coming into the principal brand, including the, uh, the reopening of what was the Hotel Russell as the principal London in the early part of 2018. Um, I, I agree with Serena. I think there's, a, there's definitely, a, for us, I suppose, we're, we're probably a hybrid uh, where we're sort of owner-operator, but very much when we go into a market, we, we can look at that market and decide what is appropriate and the right thing to do to ensure that we, you know, we, we get that stickiness in that market. David, Serena, Nicholas, thank you very much. We remain diverse, innovative and optimistic. And that's probably a message for the morning. Thank you.